Yeah, I might gonna get us right. But y'all got the scripture already, so yeah. yeah. yeah James one, verse two through four. Amen. Has some technical difficulties. So today I want to talk to you for a small moment about he's setting you up for the good stuff. And like I said earlier, I did look it up. And Google, it's a setup, and it's a setup says a situation has been planned to deceive someone or to make them seem guilty of something they didn't do. And again, watch the movie Friday Night Lights and what's the name? Kevin Hart is being set up to look like he's done something that he did not do with a negative connotation. But again, look around. I'm looking to do it again. Abe been to the Mosey Wall. He been to the Jew joint. He been to the hole in the wall. And when you go in the hole in the wall, you can bring your own booze, BYOB, but you have to pay for a setup. It might even be free. You may have no no no, no interest. You can get in for free, but you got to buy you a setup. And and if everybody on the table, if you can get twenty dollars for four people at one table, for and what's a setup again? A setup is the little most of the time a little igloo cup, the red cup, and the igloo cup got some ice in it, and the, or the solo cup. The solo cup got ice in, it. and that's the blue one I think sometimes. And or, or you might have regular styrofoam if if it depends on the establishment. And when you get your setup, the purpose of the setup is to allow you the opportunity to enjoy your beverage. Because you can't drink while on crime. You don't want to drink hen dog that's hot. You know, you want it on the rocks. You want to mix it a little taste. So you, your crown and your coke needs some ice cubes. Yeah. Huh. So, but we ain't talking about that right that Sunday morning. Uh -huh. So, so like I said, look at your neighbor. It's a neighbor. It's the setup. Yeah, yeah, you're being set up. God is setting you up for something. So, book of James, James chapter 1, verse 1 through 2. I, mean, two, I started verse 1. The Bible says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And what does diverse temptations mean? It means many trials. And that's what they could have been frustrated with all the things that had gone wrong, all the problems that had presented themselves. But instead of me being upset, when I looked at my window and realized it was busted out, I got out of the car, I walked back around to the car and looked at it again. And I realized they had folded the window because it's tinted and stuck it under the car. So it took some time. Instead of me being frustrated like I was back in my day, I said, you know what? It is what it is. I got to drive my car home. I got to cover. I'm going to cover the car because it's going to rain the next day. So I went on, put the little car, covered it up, went on about my day. Didn't think nothing else about it. Found me one I could replace it with, hoped I could get it done, and just kept on going with my day. Because you got to realize that in this life, you're going to have tribulation. In this life, you're going to have trials that come. Trials are just tests. Examination. Some of y'all have been to school with folks. And in order for you to go from one grade to the next, you got to have a passing grade. And the only way you get a passing grade is to take the test and score high enough on the test to move to the next level. And the purpose of the test, contrary to popular belief, is not to show what you know. It's to show you what you don't know. See, we think a test is to prove how smart we are. No, it's to prove when you have deficits so you can be in focus your attention on the deficit. A good teacher won't just mark your answer wrong. They'll give you an opportunity to correct it. Because they just tell you wrong. They have not taught you anything. They just expose what you don't know and haven't helped you to learn so you can grow. And God is a great teacher. When you mess up, he doesn't mess up. He doesn't punish you because you messed up. He uses that as an opportunity. Hey, brethren, count it all joy. So that means you're supposed to be excited when stuff starts going wrong. You're supposed to be excited when stuff starts going wrong. But many of us don't get excited. We let the situation dictate how we operate. Yes, sir. See, rich people don't think like that. That's the poor man's thought process. Because if you don't have enough and you're always trying to get enough, Anything that comes to this rope, what you already don't have enough for, makes it harder for you to get just enough to sustain. But see, when you got more than enough, you'll get your income tax check in a few minutes. When you get the income tax check and you get all them thousands of dollars, if your 
tire on your car, blow out on the expressway. Instead of you getting mad, you're going to get you a new tire. You ain't going to be upset. Your mind is, I need a new tire anyway. I'm going to go ahead and put a little money. Matter of fact, I'm not going to just get one tire. I'm going to get all four. Because you got it and you can. But when you don't have money to buy gas to get to work tomorrow, and you have a flat when you come outside, now you mad, you frustrated, and you're looking for something else to go wrong because in your mind, the devil out to get you. Great question. Then he says, verse 3, to, to prove his point, he says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So you don't get patience if you never get tested because you're not born with patience. We don't want to wait for nothing. Yes, sir, Lord. We'll get to that in a minute. You got to understand that we are not born. Are you going to get there? We're going to help you. You're not born to wait on things. I see a little baby in the room right now. And one that's a little bit bigger than a baby. When the baby gets hungry, she will let you know she is hungry because she will cry. And not only will she cry, if it takes you too long, she will scream because she wants your attention. And if you don't give her your attention right then, she's going to make it so uncomfortable for you. You're going to do something to pacify, to make her leave you alone. So if that's how you were born into this world, as you get older, you think that's how life's supposed to be. If your mama and dad or your auntie, or uncle, whoever taking care of you, always come to fix your issue quickly, you ain't learned how to wait on nothing. That's why we got to tell our kids no. Sometimes, no, you can't go to the party. No, you can't have no fruity pebbles. No, you can't get a snack after dinner today. You got to wait later. Because if I keep telling you, yes, when the world come up and things go wrong, you have not learned how to be patient. You know what happens when you tell your kindergartner he can't go outside? What are you going to do? Fall out. Fall out and cry. Now you got a choice to make. Are you going to spank him? You're going to make him let him cry? You, well, but you got to do something because if you say, go ahead and go out there, the next time you say no, it's going to be even worse. That's how God does us too. He says, knowing that the trying of your faith work with patience in verse 4. But let patience, he said, but, even though it's going to make it, the conjunction with difference. He says, but let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. See, when you go through the trial, you're getting battle tested. When you buy electronics, if you look on the back, you'll see a circle with two letters in it. U-L. Universal Laboratories. That means that this electronic machine has been inspected and certified to work properly when you take it home. There shouldn't be any malfunctions in it because somebody else did some tests and made sure it worked before they sold it to you. So God allows us to go through and be tested. And if we allow the testing to work the way it's supposed to, we will be complete and wanting nothing, Lord. And then we will graduate. The problem is we don't allow the test to complete. Sometimes we just stop taking it. We'll say, God, take the test from me. God, make this stop. No, no, no. We're supposed to say, God, give me power to go through it. Because if he come down and stop it, he going to stop it. But guess what? You didn't learn nothing, so you got to repeat it again. Somebody was going to school in the ninth grade. Around Christmas time, they said, you know what? I'm sick of school. I ain't going no more. And didn't go back the rest of the year. So when school started the next year, where do you think they was at? The ninth grade. You know why? Because they decided to quit. Had they gone through the test when the, tenth, the, when the year changed, they would have been in the tenth grade. But if you let patience work perfectly, you won't want for anything. Your faith will be so strong that when the next problem comes, you don't see it as a problem. You see it as an opportunity for God to show how powerful it is. See, when the next trouble comes, you ain't tripping. You know what? I knew it was coming anyway because I'm living. As long as I'm living, I'm going to have some trouble. Job told us, man, they are short and full of trouble. Since I know I'm going to have some more trouble, I know this too. The trouble I come to, God going to bring me through. Go to 1 Peter. I'm almost out your way. 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Bible says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, 
Though now for a season, if I need be, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So you are going through many trials. It ain't just one thing. It's one thing and another. Y'all remember that song? If it ain't one thing, it's another. If it ain't, if it ain't one thing, it's another. Every time I turn around, everywhere I look, everywhere I go, I don't even have to find trouble. Seem like trouble find me. And I'm getting sick and tired of always having to fight. I'm trying to get some peace. I'm trying to get some rest. But it's like no matter what I do to do it, I'm doing what's right, but still trouble come because I ain't realized that God ain't mad at me. He's preparing me for something I can't handle right now. There's a greater level he wants me to get to, and I can't go there with the mindset I have now because if I go the way I am, I'm going to mess it up. He's got to prove me. He's got to prove me so I can be ready to move to the next level. What do you mean? I'm so glad you asked. Look at the next scripture. Bible says that the trying of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What do you mean, preacher? I'm so glad you asked. That's just First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. I'm reading it again. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Now leave that alone. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. What does it mean? That means that gold does not lose any of its properties when the fire's on it. The only thing the fire does is burn away everything that's not gold. Meaning it makes it purified. Fire is used to purify things that have been marred and are unclean. But when God wants to see himself in you, he's got to get all the things that are in you that are not like him out of the way so he can see himself. So I thought about a silversmith that tries to do silver because silver and gold have proper similar qualities, meaning you put them in a pit and then you get the fire very, very hot so that it begins to melt. And then you begin to see smoke. And you have to be a master at goldsmith or silversmith. You just stir. And the man says, sir, how do you know when the silver is ready? He says, he's stirring it and stirring it and the smoke is coming and the fire is hot. He says, when I can look down and I can see myself, that means it's ready. God says, I know you're saying you love me and you want to be with me. You want me to take you higher. But until he can see himself in you, he can't take you to the next level. How does he see himself? He's got to burn all those things the word has put on you to keep you from being able to be what he wants you to be. He got to burn it away. And y'all know fire hot. To get metal to melt, it has to be extremely hot. To test your faith, it's got to be extremely hot. Meaning, if you can stand it, it ain't enough. If God give you trouble that you can handle, that ain't going to test you. You kick your toe on the bed, it hurt for a second, but you can keep on moving. Break your ankle and see what happens. He'll give you small stuff to keep you alert and let you know you're alive. But he want to test you, he's going to give you something you got to call on him for. He's going to make you call him. And when you have enough sense to know if he did it once, he'll do it again, you are more quick to call and ask for help because all he wants to do is be in your presence. But he wants you to come to him, not him have to come to you. And how do I get your attention? I make things a little more difficult and you know I got the answer. When you send your kids off to college and they get broke, you know what they're going to do? Call you. If they won't call you back and you gave them a credit card, you know how to get them to call you? Stop the call. Cut off the resource. Guess what? They called him. Mama, turn the cell phone off. Mama, daddy, what? My cell phone off. I know because I called you three times last week and you didn't respond to my call. So I didn't pay the phone bill. My bad. I'm sorry. Here we go. Now we cop and do Same that we do with God. Instead of saying, I apologize. What did you need me to do, mom? And then God says, I'm so glad you called, son. This is what I need. I'm going to turn the phone back on. And I'm going to handle your business for me. God says that your faith is more precious than gold. 
If gold is, the most, is one of the most precious elements on earth, your faith is much more precious than that to him. Totally is a setup. Now I'm almost at the way. Go to Psalm 84. And I'm going to sit down and let you hope you happy. Psalm 84. Bible says in Psalm 84, I'm going to read from verse number 9 to verse number 12. Depending on your translation, you find words. The Bible says, Behold, O God, our shield, and look unto the face of thine anointed. He says, Look on your son's face. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. Say a day in the Lord's presence. One day in his presence is better than a thousand days. You know how long it takes to get a thousand days? It's 365 days in one year. So you got to have two and some years to equal the one day. He said it's worth two and some odd mm, years to be in your presence for one day. You know how strong that is? He's saying, God, if I could explain to you how important and how much I love you, I, mm, he's trying to give an illustration to the reader, and a thousand to them was a lot, a whole lot. He says one day is as a thousand. Then he goes on and says, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in a tent of wickedness. Paint the picture a little better. He says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. You know what a doorkeeper is? See, some of y'all, you know, we from Memphis, we don't really see elevators. I'm going to give a better illustration. You ever been to one of them hotels, they got some, they get the Peabody, and there's some dude standing right there, push the button, let you in, push the button, get you your flow, push the button to get you out. That's his whole job to keep the door. He ain't got, he don't stay there. He don't have nowhere to rest. He is there to work. He says, man, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. I mean, I ain't got nowhere to rest. I'm here to do my job. I'm here to serve. Then to dwell in the tent of wickedness. To dwell means to live in, to experience, to enjoy, to take all the trappings and benefits of being. He said, instead of me being in the tent and be welcome and be pampered and taken care of, I'd much rather just work the door in your house. Because your house is so clean and so holy. So inviting, I'd rather stand at the door, even if I can't come in, than to go in the tent where I'm going to be pampered and catered to, hand and foot. Because I'd rather have Jesus. I'd much rather have the good. Because a day, it's like a thousand. And it's hard for us to comprehend because we live in a day where we can get anything we want if we got enough money or influence. You can go to Kroger, you can go to Walmart. You can get on Amazon. You can get on eBay. You can use Timu. You can get whatever you want and it'll come to your house. See, in those days, they didn't live like that. The stuff you had to get, you had to go get. See, I remember growing up in the country, and when it was time for dinner, we had to go outside in the backyard and pick the snap beans. Then you had to split them down the middle. Then you had to put them in the bowl. Then you had to wrench them off. Then you had to put them on the stove, and we had to light the stove with a match and some paper because the powder had gone out. You can't just go over there and sit and eat dinner. You can't put it in the microwave for 45 seconds. It was a whole afternoon to get dinner ready. And that was every single day. So it's hard for us to rationalize when it comes to talking about the things of God. Him saying, I'd much rather just stand at the door and work. Than to be in here eating and living good. Bossing up. Then he goes on. I'm almost out the way. Let's check a part of it. For no good thing will be withheld from them that walk uprightly. It's a setup for the good stuff. All the stuff you've gone through, all the trouble you've been in, all the problems that have come is just a setup for the good stuff. Because what I talked about in a minute, in the beginning, I said it's a setup. That is one word. Setup means to deceive, just to falsely accuse. But see, this setup is different. When you get ready to have a party, somebody's got to set up. And when you set that up, there's two words. And that set up is just preparation. God's trouble that you're going through is not to hurt you, to deceive you, to make you accused. No, no, no. It's not to seem and make you appear guilty. It is to set you up, i.e. prepare you for the good stuff. So you can't get the good stuff if you ain't ready for it because the good stuff will make you leave him. And since he's not going to hurt you and make you leave him, he's got to take you through some things 
to show you worthy, just like you do with your friends. You better, you need to take the folk you say your friends through some stuff. If they ain't gonna go through nothing with you, they don't need to be able to put their feet up under your table and eat your dinner. They don't need to be in your car. If they ain't gonna go through nothing with you, that's not your friend. If when trouble comes, they leave, keep them out there. We got too many folk we hang with that don't, you can't find them when you need them. The minute you have a need, they get on down. If it look like you home, they're going to leave. Yeah. When they get some food, they're going to make sure they don't come around you until they finish. Come belch in your face. You'll get them your last. They won't give you a piece of their first. We got to be careful how we associate ourselves. But God is saying, I want to give you the good thing and I ain't going to hold nothing back. But you got to be ready to receive it. And if you love me, you're going to go through whatever I set for you because you know it's a setup. It's a setup for the good stuff. And the good stuff he got, he got it all, baby. And I don't want it all. But I got to be ready for it all. I got to have room to receive it. And the problem is the things that keep us from him are taking up space. I can only get so much stuff in it. Y'all don't earn to drive a dump truck, the garbage truck. When he get his first load, the truck is empty. It don't matter what he do with that first load of garbage. He just jump it in the back. But there comes the time... You got to realize I can't get no more. Call them full. Even if my route ain't done. If there's some more, even if I got to go back and dump that load, it's going to take me longer to get home because it seems like everybody got garbage today. And since I ain't got no space, I can't go to the next road because I can't get all this. In. We got to understand God knows that we accumulate. Y'all ever had to move out of place and go somewhere else? You'll be like, man, I don't need but one little U-Haul. I ain't got that much stuff in there. Man, you start moving stuff. You're like, where this come from? What's this? Because you didn't pack stuff and hear stuff from yourself. Because over time, you just accumulated a whole lot of stuff. Life the same way. When you're walking with God, you're doing what's right, you still just accumulating a whole lot of stuff. But now you're trying to take you to the next level. You can't go to the next level until you leave the old stuff behind. Because you're a new creature now. Some of y'all, when you move into your new house, you know, you don't want to take the old furniture. Some of us had to because we had a lot of money. We took a couple of things. We couldn't buy nothing new right there. But I'm going to say, when you move, you want to go out the old house with new stuff. Because you want to take the new stuff into the new place so everything is new. And God said, that if you want to move with me, and leave all this stuff behind. Now you got to exercise faith. Because you're moving with nothing. But hope and faith in me that I will provide all that you need. You know how hard it is to operate on faith when you come from a poor man mentality. It's hard when you've been poor to have faith. Because you ain't never had enough. Are you telling me I'm supposed to give away the little I got? And hope you're going to give me more? No, sir. I don't want you to hope nothing. I want you to have faith that I will. Because see, you hope for what you can see. You have faith in what you can't see. Now, I know I can't see God. I know I ain't never going to see him until this time to see him face to face after I depart from time and separate my soul from my flesh. But what I do know is what I've seen so far is evidence enough that I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. No matter what I got to leave behind, I got to let it go because it's going to hinder me from going to where God's taking me. There's a place that he's got for me that I must be able to walk into, but there's some things I got to do on this side to prepare. And since I got to be prepared, he's setting me up, making preparations so I can walk in. It feels bad. It hurts. Some of y'all, oh yeah, some of y'all got hunts on your feet right now. And if you wanted to put on some good shoes, because you're going to a wedding, in order to get the shoes on your feet, because they got to fit perfectly, you got to go sit down in one of them chairs, in one of them foot spas. And when, they, when you take your shoe off, they're going to be like, oh my God, what have you been kicking? And when they start working on your feet, oh my God, you talk about, man, I got one belt. I got one. Miss Jolene is on the platform. I'm going to use you one belt. I got some insurance. Told you. Went to the dentist. I ain't been to the dentist since the babies was born. Wow. Lady says, I got to clean your teeth, Mr. Brown. I said, okay. So that's going to be kind of tough because you ain't been clean in a while. But you may have a little gingivitis, may have a little gum disease starting. We want to stop it now. And the first step is getting your teeth good and clean. 
She said, it may take a couple of times. It may take me numb in your mouth, but we're going to get it in there and get it. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my mouth. She said, oh, my God. I said, what? You haven't been in a while, have you? I said, no, ma'am. It's been a long time. But I had to get my mouth fixed because I wanted to be straight. She sat me down, put me in that chair, lean me back, put the little thing around my neck, put the little stuff on my gums. Okay, we're going in. And she started to work around my gums. Her prayer was fine. All around him, awesome. Other side, the top ain't that bad. Oh, no, no, no. Then she got to the bottom. Outside, not too bad in the front. A little bit, but not too much. Then she went inside my bottom row of teeth. The woman started sweating on this. She in that gun in my mouth like this. She's like, bah, 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 bah. She like oh, is that her? Oh, my God. She's like, oh, my God. You're a tough as nail. I said, no, this girl get through. I'm like, this can't do I don't. Because I don't want nothing to hinder me from my mouth healing. It, it hurt like the dickens, but I know that when she get through, she through. And when she through, my mouth can heal. And in order to be healed, I was willing to take the pain. If I can let that woman dig in my mouth, it would blood everywhere. But I was, when she got through, I'm like, oh my God, it feels amazing. She said, make sure you come back. I said, don't worry, I'll be back. I ain't scared of you. <laughs> I ain't scared because you hurt my mouth. But I went through the pain because I knew there was a blessing on the other side. Are you willing to go through with God? She was setting me up. <laughs> what did you say, bro? What did you say? You okay? I said, I didn't get there. I didn't get there. Get there. I'm not black. I didn't get there. I don't just get there. Woo! Jesus Christ, you're talking about pain. I done been through some, I done told my knee about that surgery. All that, oh, that woman digging in my mouth. Oh my God. I thought I was going to see Jesus. Woo! It was, woo! And she knew what was hurting. She said, you okay, you okay, you okay? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to get through. Get through. Don't ask me no questions. Whew, just get through. Hey, hey, no, she gave no, I don't want no shots. She said, like, sometimes we have to numb people. She ain't numb. Just get through. Just get through. Just, just get through. Yeah. I know I'm bad. I told you, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't like y'all. I'm, I am different, man. God took me through some stuff. And if God can take me through and bring me on the other side, I know whatever I come to, it's a mind thing. If it ain't going to kill me, I'm going to endure. I take those natural things, it's like me being in the gym, like me being tired, and I take it to the spiritual realm. So when the Lord sees something to take me through, I trust him. And I know if it don't kill me, it make me strong. And if it does kill me, it was his will. And if it's, will, if it's his will, it's exactly what I need to happen. So I ain't tripping. I'm going with it. I trust him with everything I am. Because if I don't trust him like that, I can't expect nothing from him. I can't expect him to take me to the next level if I don't trust him to take me to the next level and be with me through the next level because there may be another level. Because with every new level come a new devil. And I got to have him with me to go through that too. And I, like I said, I'm on the Lord's side. I can't lose. You can't lose with the stuff we use. Amen. Let us make sure we stay with God and realize this is just a setup. He's setting us up for the good stuff. It don't feel good, but what's on the other side is good. I know Dad, we had a little baby right here. And when she was having that baby, oh my God. It's, it's, it's scripture to talk about it, but I know when the baby was crowning, you talking about pain. And if you think the crowning is pain, I, don't, I ain't felt the mama bottle, but I watch. You think that crowning is pain. When them shoulders get ready to come up out of there, and the doctor got to put his hand in there and twist. Oh my God. I said, What am I watching? Jesus, I know that. Happened. Oh my God. Extreme pain. I'm not. Then when the baby come out, make sure they boop, go right back up. Look, they go. Like, man, what just happened? Like, wow. But you know what's so funny? When they bring a little nasty blood feels, embryonic fluid, baby, all they be like, Oh my God. They be patting them an ugly thing. They, pat, they ain't clean. They ain't clean it off yet. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Cause the joy outweighs the pain. The joy, the pain was intense because the joy was gonna always be greater. Remember this: whatever God takes you through, the pain that it causes you to get through it is is always gonna be less than the joy that comes out. And when I know that, I don't mind going. Sometimes I want something hard. Because I know if I go through something hard, guess what? What's on the other side is going to be easy. It's going to be great. The harder the problem, the greater the blessing. 
So when the devil starts throwing stuff at me, I ain't get mad. I'm like, all right, come on in. What's up? Let's do this. We're going we to dance. Let's dance. But one thing I know, you ain't going to kill me. It might hurt a little bit. I took a couple of shots. Because at the end of the day, when the final bell told, I'll come out victorious because I'm on the Lord's side. And when I win, I get my crown. And that's all I want. I want my crown. I want, I want nothing. Boom. He's setting you up for the good stuff. You stay in the fight. Amen? Amen. You stop it, Mike. And, 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 